So why don't we go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the Cancer Center Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dario Altieri. He comes to us from Wistar Cancer Center uh, in Philadelphia. He's also the Robert and Penny Fox Distinguished Professor. He directs the Immunology, Microenvironment, and Metastasis Program. So he covers a lot of the bases that we cover. He's originally from Milan, and he uh, became a practicing uh, clinician in Milan, earned a postgraduate degree in clinical and experimental hematology. And he joined Scripps as a research fellow and then joined the faculty. And after that, went to UMass, where he founded the Department of Cancer Biology. And then that brings us to his recruitment to the Wistar Cancer Center, where he currently serves as the director uh, of the Cancer Center and chief executive officer. In terms of his research, our heart goes out to him. He just completed his defense of his CCSG. So uh, he looks remarkably balanced after all that. Uh, Doug stayed balanced as well, so in contrast to me. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. And so he just completed that, and he is the PI, of course, on that P30 grant. He's also the PI of a program project, which is focused on prostate cancer, and he has numerous seminal contributions to the field. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, and, and first to understanding the importance of progression-associated dynamics within the microenvironment. He's published over 225 peer-reviewed studies, which include the discovery of survivin, which is one of the first molecules talked about in terms of uh, surviving uh, apoptosis, right? <laughs> it was named well. And his more recent emphasis, which I think he's going to talk, uh, talk about today, is the uh, is, is the unique biology and therapeutic reprogramming of mitochondria uh, within uh, tumor cells. Years ago, I was talking with him last night, saw this video of somebody actually watching mitochondria time-lapse move through a cell, and they move uh, with high speed. So uh, it'll be interesting to hear his perspective on that. Um, and, of course, it has implications on not only progression but also therapy, and he's the recipient of an R35 to study that topic. So. He's been busy. Dario, thank you so much for, for coming. Appreciate it. Jim, thank you, thank you so much for the uh, warmest hospitality. I had a great time during the visit, and I look uh, forward to uh, the continuation of my time here in Minnesota. Um, this is my financial disclosures. I love this slide. Um, and, uh, you know, we've been spending a lot of time both in the lab and in the clinic thinking a little bit about precision medicine, personalized medicine. And I think despite, you know, the revolution brought about by immunotherapy, some of the same challenges and goals also apply to immunotherapy regimens. Without trivializing the conversation, the idea behind personalized medicine is that we now are in a position based on technological advances to really try to give the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Uh, so moving beyond the idea of the carpet bombing of chemotherapy for, for cancer treatment. And just as important, leverage, you know, prognostic markers, uh, biomarkers of uh, uh, prediction for ther therapy responses, just as important not give the wrong drug to the wrong patients, which would simply exacerbate side effects. It sounds good. It's been pursued aggressively uh, for almost a decade. Uh, but there are several conceptual and, um, and, and, and practical challenges in really bring this to fruition. And I'm just going to show you an example of that uh, that has to do, you've probably seen these slides before. This is a, an image of a 38-year-old man with uh, metastatic, extensively metastatic disease coming from a BRAF mutant melanoma. Um, this was the era before immunotherapy, before uh, uh, when bemorafenib, a small molecule inhibitor of uh, activated BRAF, was introduced in the clinic. 15 week treatment, almost miraculous tumor regression, and, uh, and dramatic responses um, observed against the metastatic disease that, that before that was considered you know, a very challenging, mostly fatal condition. But you know what comes next, and what comes next is the disease itself. Just in a matter of weeks, um, the um, uh, metastatic melanoma comes back roaring, and at that point is resistant. And so uh, this picture, I think, could, could be applicable to a variety of personalized therapies or, and molecular agents that have been tested in the clinic, really suggesting that the dream that started with Gleevec, the introduction of Gleevec for the treatment of chronic myelogenous leukemia was a little bit 
the exception uh, rather than the rule. So what happened in this particular case, we're, we're not really sure what happened, but what we think has happened is that the tumor changed and evolved, um, put under a, a tremendous selective pressure by conditions in the microenvironment that are indicated here in terms of hypoxia, changes in biochemicals of the microenvironment, for instance, acidity related to lactic, lactic acid production, and certainly in response to therapy, which is a very potent stress stimulus that we impose on uh, the microcosm of, uh, of tumor growth, tumor cells evolve and, uh, and, uh, and, find, uh, and find ways to uh, manage to escape whatever stress stimulus is being imposed on them. And treatment and therapy is a very potent stress stimulus that drives tumor plasticity or adaptation. And eventually, what we end up with is a more aggressive disease. So it's the acquisition of more aggressive disease traits, in particularly, in particularly related to metastasis. I, do I have a pointer here? Well, that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. So our lab has been interested for the past few years in trying to figure out a little bit what happens uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of tumor adaptation uh, and tumor plasticity. What are, if we consider tumor as a tissue, as it should be, um, what are the signals that govern the acquisition of more aggressive disease traits? You know, consider that when we see a spot on a chest X-ray or, or a CT scan, that's one centimeter, that's one billion cells. And those are hundreds of clones in constant competition and cooperation with each other. How do they work out? So in, in to, ta to, to tackle this, we uh, focus on, on one of those fundamental nodes of uh, tumor biology, and that is the pietri kinase pathway. Um, it's considered a universal cancer therapeutic target because it does so many things in, uh, um, in regulating so many different functions of tumor cells. Thank you so much. Uh, which are indicated here, you know, uh, center on the activation, you know, it's part of the main growth factor receptor pathway, activation of pietri kinase, then feeds back on regulation of AKT and the mTOR pathway. And the functions, it does a little bit of everything. Controls uh, cell survival, motility, cell proliferation, cell growth in terms of individual cell volume. This has not escaped, of course, the attention of people interested in drug development and a variety of small molecule inhibitors to pietri kinase, either pan pietri kinase or, or individual pietri kinase subunits have been developed. Many of them have entered clinical trials. They have not fared too well. Actually, they've not fared well at all. And so we felt that this was perhaps an interesting model for us to try to understand a little bit how is it that therapy sometimes generates more aggressive disease traits. And so what we, uh, what we found was something that, uh, you know, had been uh, um, suggested in the literature that, in fact, exposure of tumor cells, and we use the model of both prostate cancer and glioblastoma, exposure of tumor cells to a pietri kinase inhibitor, small molecule inhibitor, actually reprograms the tumors dramatically. This is an experiment where we're looking at patient-derived glioblastoma organoids. It's a phospho-blot before and after exposure to PX866, which is a pan pietri kinase inhibitor. And as you can see, there is massive reactivation of all sorts of growth factor receptor signaling um, in response to pietri kinase inhibitor. These molecules become phosphorylated. Um, and they involve the EGFR uh, family member, insulin receptor, fam uh, insulin receptor family member, IGF-1R. The very same molecule that is intended to be uh, inhibited by this antagonist is actually reactivated. Uh, same experimental model that is a reactivation of phospho-AKT and phospho-mTOR in the, um, in the uh, uh, GBM organoids. And when we profile these uh, organoids uh, by RNA sequencing in order to try to understand what were the pathways that these growth factor receptor reactivation would activate, we were surprised that there were really two main uh, um, transcriptional programs. One that had to do with inhibition of cell death, so improved cell survival. But the other one was a number of gene pathways and networks that had to do with cell motility. Uh, involving cell spreading, cell invasion, cell migration, microtubule dynamics, and cytoskeletal rearrangement. And just as a refresher, cell motility, tumor cell motility in particular, is one of the most uh, uh, elaborate and energy-intensive processes that tumor cells uh, can decide to undergo. And it's a, it's a process that really centers on acting cytoskeletal remodeling, 
is a very elaborate and very sophisticated mechanism that really is centered on the creation of active lamellipodia and philopodia at the leading edge of cell migration that results in really assembling a microdomain at the plasma membrane where there is activation of cell motility kinases, in particular focal adhesion kinases. And this is eventually the process that drives the crawling of cells, of tumor cells across, first through the extracellular matrix, but then across basement membranes, and that is obviously the molecular prerequisite of metastatic dissemination. So we were interested to see whether exposure of, exposure of P3 kinase inhibitor in this context would activate some of the pathways that are known to be involved in cell motility. And so the first, ex first experiment, we actually, we actually used time-lapse video microscopy to image the dynamics of lamellopodia. These are the little feet that the, the cells uh, that are migrating uh, send out in order to uh, actually crawl through the extracellular space. And they are dynamics. They form and they and disassemble. And basically, the time-lapse indicates here the e each of these periodicities indicated here in the ruffle, ruffle formation. And in response to... Uh, either the GDC-0941, this is a pan p kinase inhibitor from Genentech, or the AstraZeneca compound, you see that it is not just an increase in amplitude of the um, lamellipodia formation, but also of frequency of lamellipodia assembly. When we looked at the dynamic nature of focal adhesion complexes, these are, these are the, the, the region of interface between the extracellular matrix and the plasma membrane. Again, they assemble a variety of signaling kinases, and they are highly dynamic, um, using, again, time-lapse video microscopy of cells imaged with tailing GFP. There's a massive change in the, dispos in the, uh, in the framework of focalization kinases, focalization complexes, with a decrease in stable complexes and a massive increase in both the new and decay complexes. Again, very dynamic process. And this means that the cells are more motile. This is a 2D chemotaxis, rose blot. Um, showing that the PX866 treated cells actually lose uh, the directionality of cell migration and become random, and that, that process becomes random. It's a, it's a very dangerous occurrence for cancer because that is thought to be uh, another major driver of uh, metastatic propensity. You know what comes next? Uh, if the cells migrate, is, chances are that they also invade, and they do. This is an experiment where we Actually, you're looking at uh, three-dimensional spheroids uh, embedded in a collagen matrix. This is a traditional transwell membrane uh, invasion across matrigel. And just exposure to two different clinically achievable concentrations, PX866, results in massive invasive potential. And this translates, unfortunately, in vivo in a further increase in the metastatic propensity of uh, um, prostate cancer cells. This is a model of visceral metastasis in the liver. Treat, cells treated with the PX uh, increase not just the number, but also the percentage, the metastatic burn. And if you consider that this is the stuff that we put in patients, it, um, it, was, uh, it was quite disconcerting. So how does it work? I mentioned a moment ago, and the cell biologists argue constantly as to what is the most energy-intensive processes that the tumor cells can undergo to. People speculate that it's either this or transcriptional control, but we were interested in trying to understand what is really the fuel that powers up that machinery of cell motility and the membrane lamellipodia dynamics. And the first experiment that we did was an experiment of imaging of fluorescence microscopy. And what we noticed was that exposure of tumor cells, both the GBM cells or the prostate cells, to either the PX inhibitor or the GDC0941 inhibitor really results in a redistribution of mitochondria from their normal perinuclear position, they cluster, you know, they, they, it's, uh, these are highly dynamic organelles, but they tend to cluster around the nucleus under normal conditions. But exposure to these uh, uh, drugs drives the mitochondria across uh, the, cyto the cytosol uh, to infiltrate the uh, peripheral cytoskeleton. We call, call it the cortical cytoskeleton, the cytoskeleton that is really specialized at the border between the plasma membrane and the extracellular matrix. This is the quantification of that experiment showing that both drugs really drives the process by which most of the mitochondria actually now are infiltrating um, the cortical cytoskeleton compared to the controlled cells. 
And when they infiltrate the cortical cytoskeleton, the mitochondria becomes in, in physical proximity with those focal addition complexes that I mentioned a moment ago and that you've seen in the cartoon slide. And this is a confocal microscopy imaging where we are looking at mitochondria in red and the phosphorylated version, phosphorylated status of focal addition kinase. They don't co-localize, but they are in physical proximity, indicated here in response to the PX866. And, and, you know, mitochondria are considered popular in, in the popular uh, notion as the powerhouse of the cell. So an obvious experiment was to ask the question whether these had to be energetically active in order to get there and do whatever it is that they were doing. So to do that experiment, we generated cell li cell line from the GBM, uh, LN229. It's called the Rho cell. So you basically poison mitochondrial DNA uh, with the tidium bromide, the cells don't really like it, but they manage to stay around for a few for a few passages. And when we do that, the raw cells actually do not localize; they do not infiltrate the mitochondria here in green. In the control cells, they again they infiltrate the cortical cytoskeleton, but in the raw cells, they don't. The lamellipodia dynamic is virtually abolished in these cells, so they don't have the membrane dynamicity that is required to recruit focal adhesion kinase and, and other motility kinases. And of course, these cells are frozen. In terms of the focal adhesion complex dynamics, most of those complexes are stable. They don't change back and forth, and the cells don't invade at all. Suggesting, again, that, that, they, uh, that an energetically intact mitochondrial bioenergetic function is required for the trafficking of mitochondria to the cortical cytoskeleton. We did the experiment in another way, and we used a, a small molecule inhibitor of oxidative phosphorylation um, in this particular case, and we got the same response. Um, the PX866 plus of the GDC0941 drug plus this molecule called dimitrium actually results in, in emptying those focal addition complex sites from mitochondria. Um, you have seen this experiment before, the lamellipodia formation, the dynamicity of lamellipodia formation is abolished. Um, and this results in a dramatic inhibition of metastasis in the model of uh, uh, bone metastatic disease using PC3 cells that are injected directly in the diaphysis of the bone. What you're seeing here is a 3D reconstruction of a micro CT image of, a of mice that are treated with dimitrinib or uh, vehicle control. So, the, the idea is then, uh, you know, exposure of cells, tumor cells to the, you know, broad spectrum molecular therapies, PH3 kinase inhibitor, not only reprograms the transcriptional network in tumor cells, but actually drives mitochondria to the cortical cytoskeleton. And the mitochondria, in order to get there, have to be energetically active. And so we're talking about metabolism at this point, and this is the most updated version of the, um, a few years ago, um, of the hallmarks of cancer, the, uh, the, the landmark review article by Hannan and, um, and Weinberg. And the idea is that now in the updated hallmark of cancer, altered metabolism is one of those in, in probably invariable traits. It's one of those changes that probably occur to a varying extent, but it's probably occurring in every tumor. And what is ex exactly happening? Well, largely is a reprogramming of uh, glycolysis. Uh, was originally discovered by this gentleman here, uh, Otto von Warburg, who was 1931 Nobel laureate um, for a paper that he wrote, The Root of Cause of Cancer. And it was brilliant, though, because he actually, uh, utilizing 1920 technology and biochemistry, he actually realized that there was a very big difference between normal tissues and cancer tissues using, you know, tissue slices from a rat uh, uh, syngenetic tumor in the sense that normally in normal cells, uh, cells take up glucose, which is a fuel, and goes through the uh, glycolytic steps in the cytosol, and then the product of that pyruvate gets shunted into the mitochondria for the TCA cycle and uh, the uh, oxidative phosphorylation. That is a very efficient process, generates, you know, the 36 molecules of, the, of ATP that you study in biochemistry 101. Tumor cells don't do that, or they don't do that very uh, efficiently. In fact, glucose is still taken up, but, but, but to a much higher extent than normal cells, goes through glycolysis, and then instead of 
pyruvate getting shunted into the mitochondria, it's further processed into lactic, lactic acid. And, you know, this is actually what happens normally in normal tissues that are exposed to low oxygen concentrations, right? Anaerobic glycolysis. But tumor cells do that even when no, no, uh, normal concentration of oxygen is present. And so Warburg concluded, well, you know, if tumor cells do that, there must be something wrong with the mitochondria. And so for uh, when this was actually rediscovered, the idea of uh, the Warburg effect was rediscovered in cancer biology about 10, 12 years ago. The field was really dominated by this process and the idea that mitochondria could contribute somehow to alter tumor metabolism was a little bit um, heresy. Now, that, that idea has changed and in fact now there is really a resurgent role for thinking of mitochondria as an important component of tumor metabolism. The original idea that Warburg had that mitochondria had to be dysfunctional in cancer is not accurate. Mitochondria are perfectly functional, and they keep doing all sorts of things in tumor cells as they do in normal cells, controlling metabolism, signaling bioenergetics, um, oxidative stress, and in a very complex process, and of course, a very complex process of cell death regulation and apoptosis. To the point where now there is a speculation that mitochondria actually particip participate probably in all the different stages of tumor onset and progression, including metastatic dissemination. I think the, you know, the, the role of mitochondria in cancer is still emerging. I think that there is, there is a, these, these are all relatively recent changes in, uh, in mindset. Um, and, and we're seeing more and more involvement of a variety of these functions uh, as they become exploited by the, by the transformed cell population. So against this backdrop, we wanted to try to understand what was the role of these cortical mitochondria. This is a very nice picture. They're, they're taken in the lab with the mitochondria in red showing, you know, the process of infiltration and migration uh, towards the cortical cytoskeleton. So, so we thought, well, maybe, maybe these cortical mitochondria are there uh, to really power up locally, not as a general uh, bioenergetic response, but to power up locally all the things that need energy, that need ATP, in order to deliver um, membrane lamellipodia dynamics, recruitment of uh, um, cell motility kinases, and ultimately acting cytoskeletal remodel. So we, we posited, we felt very smart about this idea that perhaps it's not the, how much ATP is being generated, but where it is being generated um, that, drives, uh, that drives cell movement. So the idea of regional bioenergetics, we felt really, really good about it. But in reality, we should have read the literature a little bit more <laughs> because, in fact, that idea is very well established in neurons. Now, neurons are these big cells. They have a very huge cell body, and they have these axons that are up to one meter long. And so, you know, you can't really rely on global energy production to power up very energy-intensive process at synapses, axonal terminal, presynaptic button, and growth cone. And so to do that, mitochondria travel, as Jim was telling us at the beginning. They travel along polymerized microtubules. There is an elaborate machine uh, that really drives the mitochondria, anchors the mitochondria to the microtubules, and then utilizes cellular motors, uh, kinesin, family members, to move in an anterograde direction, so from the nucleus to the periphery, and back. It's called retrograde direction, from the periphery back to the nucleus, and that is mediated by dynein. And, and that is the only way in which you can generate the 5 billion molecules of ATP per second that these cellular processes require. The glycolysis can't give you that, obviously. So after finally we realized that there is a literature that we had to read, the question was, well, maybe tumor cells uh, utilize a similar machinery that, that also drive, they exploit, right, they steal. Uh, the uh, neuronal machinery of mitochondrial trafficking to do the same job and, and power up specifically cell motility, cell migration. And so to try to ask that question, we developed the uh, um, high-throughput you know, global shRNA screen with the idea to identify mitochondrial motility genes uh, that would be specifically involved uh, in cancer, in cancer cell migration. And this was the process. Remember I showed you the data before about Dimitrinev being able to shut down mitochondrial-dependent cell motility. 
So we asked the question of what genes would be able to, would be required in order for this process to occur using an SHRNA screen. We went through the, the exercise. It took us quite a bit of time, learned a lot. And the bioinformatics analysis of the genes that were identified in the SHRNA screen I, I identified, revealed uh, some, some, you know, known uh, or expected culprits. A lot of molecules on the cytoskeleton, molecules involved in migration, and WD-containing proteins. But the top hit in this screen was this guy up here. And that's syntafenin. Syntafenin is a molecule that has been well characterized in neurons. And it's the break. It's, uh, it's considered to be um, the molecule that arrests the trafficking of mitochondria along the polymerized microtubules. This is an example, a model at least, of anterograde direction in neurons, where you have your mitochondria that are being anchored by an atypical GTPase called NERA in Drosophila, or ROT1 or 2 in mammalian cells. There is an adapter protein called TRAC. KIF5B is a member of the kinesin molecule that is actually the motor, and syntafenin puts the brake right here, uncoupling the mitochondria from the kinesin uh, and, and arresting mitochondrial traffic. Now, let me just say that syntafenin was not expected uh, to be expressed outside of the neural system, and that's a point that I will, I will, I will go back to in a few minutes. So, is the same model um, that has been worked out so well in neurons now being exploited and stolen um, by tumor cells? It certainly seems to be the case. And let me just show you this is a 3D, a 3D rendering, 3D reconstruction of mitochondrial motility in cells. Uh, these are prostate cancer cells which are uh, transfected with either a control siRNA, and you see the mitochondria, you know, there is no treatment with pietri kinase inhibitor in this setting. You see the mitochondria tend to cluster around the nucleus, you know, that perinuclear dis uh, distribution that we talked about a moment ago. But knocking down syntafenin changes that in this stimulus po potent enough and sufficient enough now to drive mitochondria to the cortical, to the pericolal cytoskeleton. When we image the actual motility, we can, you can actually quantify mitochondrial movement which is not, is not obviously a steady motility, but goes up and down. When we quantify mitochondrial movements in the same setting, losing syntaphony really makes these mitochondria go like crazy. You know, they increase the velocity compared to the control and the frequency by which the, they change from a stationary to a, a, mot a motile condition. And you can actually image the mitochondrial distance that is being, uh, that is being covered intracellularly, this is a 2D plot of that. In yellow are the slow-moving mitochondria. They move less than four micron. In purple are the four micron, more than four micron moving mitochondria. The control cells, and most of them are stationary. They don't really go very well anywhere. But losing syntaphonase by siRNA is sufficient to drive a massive increase, not just in velocity, but also in the distance covered by the individual mitochondria. Suggesting is really a little bit of the break, the same break that has been described in neurons that seems to be reproduced in cancer. And so we asked the question, well, you know, if you buy the idea that cell motility and cell invasion is the cellular prerequisite of metastasis, does this model apply also to actually cell invasion? And it does. This is a similar experiment. It's a 2D plot, but instead of looking at mitochondrial motility, you're looking at cell motility. It, each individual trace is a cell. You knock down syntaphenin, you convert cells that are largely stationary, don't really migrate very well, and this is the quantification, into cells that really uh, go around uh, in all directions. Remember, those are cells that lose polarity of cell migration, so they go in every different direction, regardless of the chemotactic gradient. Same concept with invasion. Uh, you lose syntaphony, you have a lot more invasive cell in a traditional trans will um, assay across matrigel. And the reverse is also true when you have a cell transfected with vector, but if you transfect a syntaphony, instead of knocking it down, now you're overexpressing, you block that invasive prop um, propensity. And we, we did the same experiment that I showed you a moment ago with, with the liver metastasis model where you inject the tumor cells directly in the spleen 
of the animals. And then after 11 days, you extract the liver and do immunohistochemistry. And knocking down syntaxin dramatically reduces the, uh, the number and size of metastatic dissemination in the liver. So suggesting it may be, you know, people have been speculating whether actually these molecules do exist, whether there is such a thing as a metastasis suppressor. Uh, and perhaps this could be one of, uh, an example of that, now really focused uh, on the mitochondria, on the mitochondrial trafficking model. And it doesn't seem to be, a, a, you know, a curiosity of a lab, um, of a lab observation when we mine, uh, you know, either the Oncomine or the PCGA database. In fact, it, it was quite dramatic that most of the tumors uh, have a decrease uh, decreased expression of syntathrin, whereas another molecule that is involved in the active transfer of mitochondria along microtubules, like MIRO2 or ROTI1 or ROTI2, showed an increase across the different tumor series that we looked at. Um, we collaborated with some of our colleagues in pathology. We looked at both uh, HER2 positive breast cancer uh, cohorts or prostate cancer cohorts, and particularly syntathrin seems to be downregulated in the most advanced disease setting. Uh, of metastatic disease. And as you might expect, uh, this is important uh, because it's clinically relevant. In patients with low syntathrin, remember this is a condition where the mitochondria travel longer and faster, where the invasion is increased, metastasis is increased. The low pa patients with low syntathrin levels do far worse um, in the two series that we looked at in colon adenocarcinoma and lung adenocarcinoma. Suggesting, that, again, a model by which tumor cells exploit is something that is probably very useful in neurons to power up those highly energy-intensive processes, specifically for the process of cell invasion. And because this is the break, because this is actually potentially a metastasis suppressor, they get rid of it over time. And so we were interested in that. How is it that this is a, how is this regulated, right? If it's, if it's something that is uh, normally present outside of neurons, and you know, it took a while to convince uh, a, a few of our reviewers, but if it's actually expressed outside of neurons, tumor cells utilize, and then it's not something that is useful for an, for an aggressive tumor, they get rid of it. And so how does that work? So we spent a lot of time in trying to figure out a little bit that question. And as you might imagine, uh, things are more compl always more complicated than we think, than we think they are. And in fact, it is not one syntaphony, but there is more than one syntaphony. It is a single locus, but it generates two very different transcripts uh, by alternative splicing. They are indicated. The splicing region occurs in one of the uh, five prime exons and generates two completely different molecules. There is a long syntaphony of 538 amino acids and a predicted short syntaphony that had not been pre previously described in the literature, shorter, but the difference is here in the amino terminus. This is a proline rich region which is lost in the short syntaphony and is uh, exchanged with the mitochondrial localization sequence. We were able to make uh, one of those reviewers happy in uh, demonstrating that this one is the syntaphylin molecule that has been described in the literature. And that is the only one that is expressed in neurons. This is a PCR analysis of syntaphylin mRNA detecting those two transcripts. We utilize primers that are indicated here that can detect either the long or the short. And so the long syntaphylin is only really present in neuro neuronal cells, but the short syntaphylin is present a little bit everywhere. And so that solved the one problem. And the second one was really to try to ask the question whether a short syntaphony that it now has an engineer the mitochondrial localization sequence actually goes to the mitochondria. And so we did a sub-mitochondrial localization experiment. Um, this is the total mitochondrial extract. There was a very robust band of syntaphony by Western blot when we fractionated the different mitochondrial compartments into outer membrane, intermembrane space, inner membrane matrix, there is a pool of syntaphony on the outer membrane, but also another pool of syntaphony in the inner membrane. These are just markers of the individual condition. So, so now we have a situation where we have actually two pools of syntaphony. Right? Now remember, in order for the mitochondria to travel, they need to be anchored on the mitochondria. Mitochondria. microtubules. 
And that makes sense that there is a pool of syntaphanin on the outer membrane because that is, right, what e exchanges the adaptive proteins and the motors with syntaphanin itself within the break. But this was unexpected, a pool in the inner membrane. So we decided to expand on that a little bit more and trying to figure out a little bit what is it that that particular pool does intrinsically inside the mitochondria. I'm not going to quiz anybody on this one also because I don't think I know many of the answers myself. What is the electron transport chain and the f uh, five different uh, mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation complexes? And syntaphanin seems to be very important in maintaining the activity of this guy, complex two. Um, this, is, this is the only complex in the, in, the TCA side, in the ATC that does not pump protons across the, the inner membrane. But it's very important to regenerate FAD. And when syntaphanin is knocked down, you, uh, the experiment here, you're looking at the uh, uh, enzymatic activity of complex two to generate fumarate. And so, uh, when knocked down, when Stephanie is knocked down here in red, the activity is reduced by about fifty percent compared to the controls. Complex one activity is not changed, so there is an intrinsic pool of Stephanie that seems to be important in bioenergetics, and that had obviously not been reported in the literature before because people had focused on the long Stephanie, the one that is expressed only in neurons. And, and this is obviously, you know, in order for this to be more effective in the presence of syntaphanin, this obviously reflects on the oxygen consumption rate, which is a measure of bioenergetic output uh, through oxidative phosphorylation. The experiment is a reconstitution experiment um, where we knock down syntaphanin. The oxygen consumption rate goes down. It's consistent with the decreased activity of complex two, but you put it back with an adenovirus and you restore it. So now we have a pool outside of the mitochondria that regulates the trafficking, but we have a pool inside the mitochondria that seems to be important in bioenergetics. And so how, what's going on? And so, in fact, those two pools of the molecules have different functions. So when we overexpress syntaphanin, because of its role in bioenergetics and energy production, cells are happier, they make more ATP, and there is an increase in proliferation both in the, in the prostate model, C4PB, and the uh, glioblastoma model. But remember, I showed you data to suggest that syntaphanin itself is, is a metastasis suppressor. So overexpression of that molecule actually shuts down mitochondrial trafficking and cell motility. So we have two processes here that are being regulated a little bit in a balance, depending on the, on, on the level of syntaphanin. And we, and we saw this very clearly in a syngenetic model of metastasis. This is a, a melanoma model where you have cell lines that are uh, taken from this model, the BRFD600E mutate, uh, mutated model with, mut with loss of CDKN2 and P10. And so we re-engineer these cells to either express the full length syntaphanin or a syntaphanin that doesn't have the mitochondrial localization sequence, right? So that's the one that drives syntaphanin inside the mitochondria is required for oxidative phosphorylation. So when you overexpress full length syntaphanin, you get this, right? You get a metastasis suppressor. You shut down disseminated lung, uh, disseminated tumor cells in the lung in this model. But when you get rid of the mitochondrial localization sequence, so this metastasis suppressor function is lost and the cells are highly macrophagic. So at this point, we started wondering whether syntaphanin levels, right, that get decreased in our analysis of patient databases, get decreased in advanced disease, might actually control two functions, cell proliferation and cell invasion. And so to try to understand this a little bit more, we did another, we, we looked at another model. And the model is very straightforward. We generate a subcutaneous xenograft. And then after three weeks, we isolated liver and lungs. We isolated the cells so that would make up these metastatic foci. And we grew these cells in the lab and trying to analyze syntaphanin levels and functions. And so when we did that, the first thing that we noticed was that the xenograft experiment where syntaphanin was manipulated in, uh, in the primary cells, loss of syntaphanin decreases the primary tumor growth. No surprise, right? You, know, you lose syntaphanin, the cells don't make enough ATP, and therefore the, their growth rate is reduced. When we looked at the metastatic cells here, 
sintafilin level was decreased. And this is also expected because it's what we saw also in the patient databases, right? So as the tumor becomes in base, in metastatic, endogenous sintafilin levels are decreased. So these cells proliferate less in the colony formation assay compared to the parental, but they certainly invade more. And this is a, another 2D chemotaxis as, um, experiment looking at cell motility of the liver and lung metastatic cell lines that are isolated here. And so this has been a, a, an unexpected twist in the story, right? People speculate that tumor cells can either proliferate or invade, but not do both at the same time because the energy expenditures associated with these two processes are too high, especially when they are under stress in the tumor microenvironment related to lack of nutrients and lack of oxygen. This is called phenotype switching. Not everybody agrees and not everybody is a fan uh, of this idea. Um, very um, respected pathologists will tell you that tumors with high KI67 staining, which is a marker of cell proliferation, are also the, the tumors that invade. However, the idea is that the phenotype switching and the proliferation motility balance is actually very dynamic, and tumor cells can switch from one to the other constantly. And so we have proposed this model where, whereby, you know, uh, when tumor cells are exposed to a favorable microenvironment, meaning that there are lots of nutrients, there's good level of oxygen tension, syntaphenin levels stay high. And when they stay high, remember this is the pool of syntaphenin that goes into the mitochondria, regulates complex two activity. They make a lot more ATP, and I, data that I didn't show you today, they make a lot less reactive oxygen species. However, high level of syntaphenin functions as your metastasis suppressor. So mitochondria don't go anywhere. There's a stop sign here. Cells don't invade, and they tend to do another thing, and that is to proliferate. High oxygen and nutrient, more cell proliferation. However, things go the other way when the microenvironment becomes unfavorable. The tumors grow beyond uh, the degree of vascularization, of its own vascularization, so that means it becomes hypoxic. Nutrient availability is reduced. Now, this is a very potent stimulus to lower syntaphenin levels. You lose the pool of syntaphenin in the mitochondria, you make less ATP and a lot more ROS. Cells, we speculate, sense that as a stress, as an unfavorable condition. And according to the diaspora model that was proposed, at least in prostate cancer, they try to escape that unfavorable microenvironment. And they escape the unfavorable microenvironment by activating this process. Uh, they are prepared to uh, give up the, 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 the ability to proliferate in favor of the ability to become more invasive and migratory. And we believe that syntaphenin represents a, a step in this process because you remove the break that drives in micro, mitochondrial trafficking and cell motility. So what did we talk about today? We talked about mitochondria, perhaps as, a, as an essential component of uh, tumor reprogression, reprogramming. Um, this should not be a surprise for anybody. Pietrokinase inhibitor should not really be used as monotherapy. Maybe there is one person that's the subject. Um, proposed that mitochondrial trafficking and dynamics in general provides a, a regional energy source to power up cell motility and metastasis. And that perhaps the mitochondria have an unappreciated role in really controlling the stress-induced proliferation motility balance, where tumor cells need to really judiciously allocate their limited resources to do one or two things, but not both at the same time. And we would like to speculate that this is not just limited to mitochondrial trafficking and cell invasion, and that really the microenvironment stress stimulus level can influence cell proliferation, retrograde gene expression, and cell death or cell survival. Uh, which are three processes that are still centered on mitochondrial function. So let me just acknowledge the folks in the lab. I have a small lab. The, these guys have been, they love the science. It's been great to work with. Uh, we're part of a, a, as Jim indicated, of a program project grant. Um, 
on right. advanced prostate cancer. He collaborated with Wister and some of the old friends in pathology in Milan that, that, um, where we access some of their tumor cells. Again, thank you very much for being here and for the great hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So the, the question was whether we uh, saw a big change in alternative splicing. We really didn't quantify the the, uh, the different splice variants in response to stress conditions. Um, what we did see is that the long syntaphinin form is truly neuronal. So whatever the splicing machinery is regulated by has to be cell type specific. So uh, the short form of syntaphinin is also present in neurons, but it's present in many other di the tissues and cell lines. But the long syntaphinin is only neuronal. Okay. Uh, Dario, I might Hold on, we need to have the sorry. microphones yeah. working. So I might have missed this. Um, but in a lot of model systems, PIP kinase signaling is actually required for a motility response. In other words, particularly growth factor related signaling, if you block PIP kinase signaling, the cells will stop moving. So can you tie the inhibition story with syntaph and, and mitochondrial relocation? So, so uh, remember that there is, there is this idea that there is a, 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 a regulatory loop after PIP kinase inhibition that you have reactivation of AKT through IRS signaling. And so that's the, the, that's the data that we have seen. And actually people have, sh have shown in, uh, in primary patient samples for, from the PA3 kinase trials in breast that there is reactivation of AKT in those biopsies. So I wonder if you looked in the, AK, at the isoform specificity oh. for PA3 kinase. We have not. That's a great, great point. We have not. I can, what, what I didn't show is that the actual motility of mitochondria requires AKT signal among some of the other cell motility kinases That's that, that we did now, but we didn't really break down the different isoforms. Very yeah. nice talk. So you mentioned that the short isoform of syntaphylin expresses everywhere in most tissues. Does that include immune cells also? And if yes, how do you know that the survival difference that you see Coming comes from the tumor infiltrating uh, immune cells. Well, so the, the um, so the answer to the first question, we didn't look at immune cells. Uh, it's uh, we we actually did, but the, but it was it, it, it was not conclusive. The, what we got back was not conclusive. We really didn't understand what we were seeing. Um, and in terms of survival, remember most of the, I mean not most, but but many of those models involve immunocompromised mice. So, you know, it's, it's possible that we might have a different, um, different outcome when, uh, when we're looking at you know, syngenetic models. Consider though the correlative data suggests the same thing from patient series. The synta low syntaphylene levels are invariably associated with poor prognosis and, low and decreased survival. Is the, is the switch between the two syntaphinin isoforms alternative splicing, or is it alternative promoter usage? No, it's alternative splicing. Okay, and then also in the in the tumor. it goes in a different reading frame, and that's how you get the mitochondrial localization. So. Okay, and then in, in the in the databases that you are mining from from TCGA, what what's the mechanism for decreased syntaphinin expression in cancer? Have you looked into that? No, we haven't. Uh, we really think. You know, one, one project that is currently ongoing in the lab focuses actually on hypoxia. And that seems to be a very important stimulus to actually shut down, to, to you know, reduce the transcriptional, um, transcriptional uh, responses of the syntaphylene locus. How does that happen? We're not really sure. But, but it makes sense, right? I mean, if you have, when, when tumors become hypoxic, the first thing that they do is to shut down mitochondrial respiration because otherwise they would make ton of ROS and really no energy. So that is consistent. How that happens, we haven't, we haven't figured it out yet. Yes. Um, really great talk. I have a question. In, in your work, how does microtubule targeting drugs could affect this migration? And could the microtubule targeting drugs have a dual function in inhibiting both proliferation and migration by reducing the polymer mass of microtubules? It's a great question. It's a great question. 
Um, so unfortunately, we haven't, we haven't really looked at that carefully. But what is known is that in order for microtubules, in order for mitochondria to travel along micro, microtubules, the microtubules have to be polymerized. Now, polymerized doesn't mean static, though. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's still an open, an open question in the lab um, because even microtubule-stabilizing drugs like taxanes actually interfere with mito mitochondrial traffic. Certainly, even blasting or vincristin do because uh, you have no microtubules in that, in that condition. But so the, um, but even microtubule stabilizing drugs interfere with the process. Now it, it's fascinating that, and I didn't talk about that, but it's fascinating. We haven't really pursued it yet. It's fascinating that in a in a, in a large, you know, in a global proteomics screen that we completed to identify other syntactin associated molecules we did see a number of microtubule-associated molecules as well. So, you know, traditional maps. And so one speculates that perhaps, you know, as part of the complex, uh, mitochondria trafficking also requires the dynamicity of microtubule assembly and disassembly. That's uh, it's pure speculation at this point. So. Oh, hi. Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering, do you, have you looked at syntaphanin concentrations in benign tumors? Benign tumors. We have not. Boy, she nails me again. No, I, no we haven't. It's a, it's a, it's a great topic. Um, we, did, uh, we did look at, uh, the, the paper is still, uh, you know, submitted. We did look um, in benign prostatic lesions. So... Prostatic intrapatellar neoplasia is called neoplasia, but it's not really a neoplasia. It's not really a precursor of, uh, of, uh, of invasive adenocarcinoma. And syntaphylin level is high in PINs. Um, and is high also in BPH, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia. So, uh, so there, is, there is the idea that, that we got from the, anal the bioinformatics analysis of the database that, you know, normal tissues have high levels and times they get progressively lost as tumors become more aggressive. Seems to hold up, but we haven't really run a comprehensive study. Jim, oh yeah, my God, now he's going to gonna nail me real, real good. Just a basic question. So is there a role for the microtubule organizing center or spindles for organizing these microtubule pathways that the mitochondria follow and cell cycle type regulation? Can you tell that to my postdocs? Because I've been trying to tell them <laughs> for a very long time, and they just ignore me, as they should. <laughs> no, so I, I, I am absolutely biased towards that model as well, but we haven't looked at it just yet. Perhaps another point for interference. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, there is a, there is, this is a very active area of, uh, of investigation of the partitioning of mitochondria during mitosis. Mitochondria, you know, they, they don't divide, right? I mean, they, they break up and you make fragments of mitochondria. That's what gets divided between the two daughter cells. That, but how that happens has not been worked out of very well. And so that clearly involves a, a micro, micro, mitochondria microtubule association. And so the, the, the MTO, the mito, mito, microtubule organizing center, is probably very important. It's, it goes back a little bit to the earlier question, right, of the micro, microtubule dynamicity of growing of the plus ends. So can you tell them? That would be really nice. <laughs> I'll email them. Okay. <laughs> Are there other questions? What a great talk. Right, thanks thanks so, much. so much. Thank you.